to many companies actually that, and, and Tom Arnold, of course, who had these amazing pictures that we're gonna share with you today. But when we started fitting scleral lenses, you know, we never realized how many lumps and bumps there were of the conjunctiva. What do you think, Tom? You know, doesn't it, everyone have a pinguacula when we start fitting scleral lenses? Yeah, Ken, Ken Pullum has a funny saying because, you know, Ken and Don Ezekiel and, and so the predecessors of, of these wonderful lenses fit really, really large lenses, you know, 23 millimeters and so. And uh, Ken said, as we started fitting smaller, you know, lenses that we're all familiar with in the 16 to 18 millimeter range, as far as he said, we discovered the pinguacula, and that, that's certainly true. Right. So, you know, pinguacula are incredibly common. Lots of my patients have pterygium. I, I practice in Northern California. I have uh, patients who have glaucoma. We're going to talk about that today, who have elevations. And all of these lumps and bumps can interfere with the, the fit of a scleral lens. So patients can have really red eyes. It's the worst thing, I think, when my patients say, oh, someone told me my eyes look red. Ooh, that's horrible. And so we want to avoid these lumps and bumps. We want to avoid, and for simplicity, you know, I'll be calling something a pinguecula or pterygium. It's any elevation on the conjunctiva. And of course, we don't want a scleral lens to touch or press on a bleb or interfere with that at all. Again, we're going to be getting that to that in a little bit. So traditionally, we could notch a lens, and notching is still an option that I use in some of my patients. So notching a lens is actually just taking an area out of the lens, and it's not as difficult as it seems. So here you can see a patient with a pinguacula, and here you can see a patient uh, with glaucoma. Now this diameter, this is a 15 four millimeter lens here. I purposely went a little bit smaller so I could notch um, that area. There are of course some limitations with notching, um, and notching is kind of, easy once you get the hand of it. So you just measure the elevation on the conjunctiva, you measure the height, you measure the width, then you put a lens, just, you know, you can put a diagnostic lens on the eye, measure again that area of elevation, then take a, a marker, a Sharpie, I tell my patients, I'm marking the lens, not the eye, just marking that area, take that off, take a measurement, talk to the lab consultant, and use a notch. So even though there are other peripheral elevations that I'll be talking about very shortly, there are some patients where they have such a huge elevation that I'm going to want to take a notch if I'm not doing an impression-based technology. And of course, there are limitations. So if someone has a huge web, 10 millimeters, for example, I can't create a notch that's large enough without having bubbles that get in at that time. Now, there are many different focal vaulting options. This can be done both within the lens, say someone with Salzman's nodular degeneration, or at the edge of the lens, someone with a pinguecula or pterygium. And it's a more reproducible elevation compared to a notch, which can be slightly different from time to time. And a spherical elevation is created centrally in the lens, and a hemispherical elevation is created at the landing zone. So there are different companies, and I'm sure you know wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us, you might have your own individual elevation that you work with. So here are just a few examples of the microvault technology. And oh, one thing, two things that we always have to tell our patients. So if they have a notch or an elevation, one, we meant to put it in there and two, the location. So for example, if the notch is going superior temporal, it's important to inform our patients, yes, this is purposely there, and it goes right here, and it doesn't have to be exactly perfect because my patients sometimes get really worried, oh, it wasn't exactly perfect, but it's gonna settle into the right spot. Number two is the staff that's teaching the patient it's important to inform them, this is exactly where the notch goes, um, so that they can teach the patient, or, or the elevation, so that they can teach the patient. I've had patients who came back and said, oh, look at this, my lens is defective, it's broken. And so that's why, yeah, you're nodding, Tom, right? Haven't you had those patients? And it's yeah. just like, 
It's just like the dot on the lens. There should be a, a new one. On your right lens. You know. <laughs> Have you ever had that, Tom? Or your patient? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Back? Absolutely. Or they just they don't pay attention, or we tell them, and maybe they ignore it. Yeah, that's right. Or you know, even with notching, I've had people put them in the wrong eye. You know, yeah. reverse the lenses and just yeah. Yeah, that's um, always an easy way to tell if one eye has a notch and the other lens does not. So the, the beauty of these elevations is that it relieves pressure. And so I'm gonna click on this. Is, Tom, I'm gonna have you talk to this slide, your, your beautiful slide oh. of the model here. Well, thanks. Well, this is uh, yeah, on, the, on the left, obviously we're illustrating you know, just uh, the lens on the eye, but on the right, that, that is a true micro vault. That is a, that is a trade name. And as, as Melissa, as you said, the, the, the difference between a micro vault and the uh, uh, true notch is a notch goes into the, the body of the lens. And so in the area of the notch, it can be thicker uh, and bubbles, as you said, could be more problematic. Uh, with the micro vault, it's truly like a little tent or a little hump over this area. So the edge thickness remains uniform throughout uh, and it's reproducible because it's actually laved into the lens. So if you do have to replace the lens, it would be exact. And uh, I just, uh, uh, I, I put, this particular product has dots. Uh, they're clear, of course, and I highlighted them here, you know, with my, my little drawing tool. So you can see how it fits just perfectly and uh, no redness. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful uh, feature to have. And here is a different company and a different sort of elevation. But here, I, I really like these pictures. You can see just the, the beauty here of how this is going to vault over the pinguecular, whatever elevation that might be. So this is the edge vault uh, from Valley Contacts. Blanchard came out with the controlled peripheral recess. And this is Tom's gorgeous picture here. Look at that. I mean, oh, just beautiful. You can see the blood vessels just flowing nice and smoothly. And it creates a really precise, controlled, and reproducible elevation of the lens. Of course, if we need to go a little bit more advanced, the iPrint Pro is an impression-based technology. It takes one to two minutes, and it matches the eye, you know, just like a, a perfectly handmade uh, shoe. I, I We always talk about shoes and scleral lenses, right? Um, so it just really is is a great option. My my most recent favorite story, I have lots of favorite stories, those of you who know me about scleral lenses, I can talk about them all day long. Um, but my, my most recent one was a new patient to me. I'd never seen him before. And he came from about eight hours away and he came to see our corneal specialist first and the story was, is that he tried a scleral lens eight hours away and he couldn't, the doctor couldn't get the lens off of his eye. And so he was actually referred for conjunctival resection and went to see the corneal specialist who said, no, I don't think you need that. And so I actually called the patient before I saw him, had a really good conversation and said, you know, is this really the story? And I asked the corneal specialist, he said, oh yeah, that's the story. I called the patient and he said, well, yes, that was the story. They tried a lens on, they couldn't get it off my eyes, sent for surgery. They told me not surgery wasn't an option. So they sent me to you. And I said, okay. And so we actually, since he came from so far away, when he came, I talked to him about different options, diagnostic fitting, eye print. But when he walked in the room, and I looked from him, I looked at him from across the room. He has the second most protruding graft that I've ever seen. So that was the reason why they couldn't get the lens off the eye. They probably tried a 16, 17 is what I think, you know, something that didn't have enough sagittal depth and they had difficulty getting it off the eye. Now, the other reason we went for eye print, besides the huge elevation of his cornea, is that he wanted something where he wouldn't have to come back a lot because he was trying to get a job, works, you know, trying to see and do it quickly. So fortunately, he was very successful and he did great with the whole process. He was a huge, huge guy, um, did great with the impression process. He had just a wonderful wife who supported him the whole way and got even better vision than I expected and really great comfort. So 
just, you know, like to throw in some clinical cases there that really can help people. So now we're going to switch gears. Uh, Tom, we're going to talk about some bubbles. Sounds good. Yeah, let's get off the uh, conjunctiva sclera and talk and get on the cornea here. And, you know, just a few tips, uh, hopefully, that uh, will help you with everybody's uh, fitting. Bubbles are something we encounter uh, from time to time, and they, they occur in two different, for two different reasons. Uh, mostly they occur, hopefully, during insertion, and that's where patients uh, are inserting the lens improperly. Or, of course, it can be during wear. Uh, and in, in the illustration here, I think that was insert, that's an insertion bubble. And the way you can tell, yeah, there's the bubble as Melissa is illustrating. And you can tell it's, in, it's, it's been there because you see that the floor scenes on the anterior surface of the contact, meaning this was at a follow-up visit where we dabbed, uh, dabbed a little floor scene on to make sure she got some flow behind it. And, and the reason you want to address these is that underneath that, you have a dry spot uh, and you'll get a punctate keratitis, so it's important. Well, the causes, the usual causes for insertion bubbles is just not enough saline in the bowl. Uh, they don't align it properly. They're not tangent or 90 degrees to the lens, and they just try to jam it in. You know, they're, they're concerned. They don't want to spill it. They just jam it up. So you always want to um, ask your patients to overfill the bowl, uh, insert it gently. Some patients uh, have their own stand they bring in. I think we have a picture of that. Uh, actually, we, we sell stands, uh, or they'll make homemade stands from a cup or, or something. I think we have a picture of that, Melissa, in the next slide. There we are. Yeah, this, this gentleman, uh, you can see previously, he, uh, he had a little cup that he brought in. There you go. So you can make a little stand out of uh, just a plastic cup or, or coffee cup and hold it. This gentleman had tremors, essential tremors, so this helped him. And then the next picture is, uh, you know, an illustration of, of what, what we mean by overfilling the bowl. Uh, here in Houston, we have the Astrodome. Some of you may be familiar with it. So I say it's just like the Astrodome. It's a big dome uh, and you want to overfill it. And then sometimes it's good. And a lot of us have recommended uh, first add three to five drops of a viscous tear, artificial tear, something like cellulose, something with uh, um, something with, with some viscosity. Uh, and that helps stabilize it as well. So those are insertion bubbles. And then the second second case we get bubbles is uh, Can during you tell wear. Tell us about this picture, though. You told me the story of. of this oh, okay, thing. yeah, the picture. Okay, so for those of you who don't recognize these ins what inserters, these are what we call wire nuts. Uh, if you if you have two electrical wires and you're wrapping them together, uh, these are put on top. You twist them, and they're they're metal and they're they're secure. And so uh, I was telling Melissa as uh, we went over the slides, I said, you wouldn't believe uh, the gentleman who, who has this, did this, is a multimillionaire. He, he is a multimillionaire, but he's a very practical guy. And he had misplaced his inserting device. He went into his garage. He said, Dr. Arnold, I, look what I found. He worked great. <laughs> so they are what we call wire nuts. Uh, but anyway, I said, well, just make sure you clean them. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Patients are very creative. So we do get bubbles during wear, and that's something that's that's on the practitioner. And most of the time, that is because the haptic's not aligned, and and or you have too much central clearance. And so as the patient blinks, there's a pump uh, that, that is created, and we pump bubbles in. You can see here, it kind of looks like uh, an aquarium where, where the fish are, are breathing and blowing bubbles. And and yeah, uh, that's that's one of our uh, micro uh, macro pictures. Anyway, you want to be aligned to the sclera. We'll talk a lot about that uh, with toric haptics. And remember that studies have shown uh, more than one study have shown that normal scleral tricity is is up to 300 uh, microns. And so a lot of us are using these toric haptics or the impression technology or, or scleral profilometry to align. But alignment is key in, in scleral lens wear. And then the other thing, what, what, what's the challenge to alignment? Well, it's decentration. Uh, you can see here, you don't need fluorescein to see this. You can easily see that the lens is dropped and you have this fluid reservoir that's prismatic in shape. Um, and so why does that happen? Well, 
everybody remembers their first year anatomy. We all, I know, recall the spiral of Toulot. Uh, again, if you're in the world of corneal lenses and soft lenses, we don't worry about this, but we get into square lenses, it becomes important. So the spiral of Toulot uh, is, is a recognition that the extraocular muscles insert uh, in a clockwise fashion uh, at different distances uh, um, to the to the limbus, and, and meaning that in the nasal aspect, it, that's where your uh, medial rectus is, is closest. And as you go inferiorly and temporally and superiorly in, in, in the circle of the spiral, um, the the recti get more remote. And not only are they more remote, but the elevation in these four major areas uh, changes as well. So this obviously affects our fitting. Yeah, spiral of, of Tolo. And so, and also what we found out is that the limbus is, is not circular as well. Uh, these are some uh, great, great illustrations from our friend Christine Sint at, at iPrint Prosthetics. And we get this from impression molding. So, and Dottie is, Dottie I know has written extensively on this, that the limbus is usually in many cases not circular, it's, it's, it's oval. Not only is it oval, it's a paraboloid where you have uh, different elevations around. So, uh, Christine, I don't, know, I don't know if our international friends get Pringles potato chips, uh, but it's a particular uh, crisp, uh, a potato crisp, uh, and they're in this shape. And this is really, for many of our patients, this is what the limbus is like too. So we're trying to you know, fit the lens, uh, land just beyond the limbus, and come out onto the sclera. So this is one of our uh, this is one of our challenges. And you can see in the next illustration, this is why this is a very common occurrence that you see excessive uh, fluorescence and excessive clearance inferiorly. Oftentimes, uh, you're landing uh, nasally and temporally, but inferiorly you have this clearance. And and over on the bottom right, you can see two different illustrations of where the lens lands. Um, nasally, temporally in a, in a with the rule sclera, let's, let's say that. Uh, you, you may just get over the limbus, but then superiorly, inferiorly, you have excessive clearance. So this leads to decentration problems as well. And I, I know everybody that's fit lenses have seen that. So what, what do we do about that? Well, again, toric haptic. Uh, the word, word toric, or the word haptic comes from the Greek word, uh, I think we have Kriakos here from uh, Kyriakos from Cyprus. I think he speaks a little Greek. Uh, haptikos, uh, meaning to grasp or, or to or to bind. But anyway, we need a toric haptic in almost all lenses. Lynette Johns, who uh, co-authored a book with, with Melissa, uh, told me uh, years ago. She said, "I 95% of all my patients get toric haptics." Tom, how many of your patients do you think have back surface tericity? Back surface tericity, uh, a lot, a lot, yeah, a lot. And the other thing too, and, and uh, this has come out too, it's not only that the limbus is maybe oval, but then the elevation's different. So uh, in, we're learning more and more, Melissa, I think that's what you're asking that, you know, in the limbal and the landing zones, we're gonna have different elevations as well. It's not just confined to the haptic. Um, I know Dottie, you, you've, you've spoken a, a lot about that. Uh, but in, in our typical lenses, we're not addressing that. Uh, we, we are still working with the haptic and we wanna steepen, we steepen that vertical meridian. And I find, and, and Melissa, I like your comment on this, that a lot of people have what we call against the rule um, scleral tricity, where, where it is flatter vertically and steeper horizontally. Uh, and so in any case, you want to steepen that uh, vertical meridian. And sometimes a wider, straighter haptic helps. A haptic that's very, very tangent or straight will help in these cases. Yeah, definitely. I, and sometimes it does depend on lens design too. Like in some lens designs, I tend to steepen yeah. more than other lens designs. Oh, that's definitely true. I think that, don't you think that's related to how the haptic is made, how the, ha the design of the haptic necessitates that? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a problem solver for some patients. Definitely. Pretty much it's a default. I, I rarely have 
um, spherical haptics at all. And then we have impingement, and we've always seen that. Uh, a lot of us have that. And sometimes the lens fits perfectly going out the door, but pa patients have very spongy conjunctiva, and we've all seen that. And so the edge of the lens will dig in. We also refer to it as towing, uh, where the, the lens is going down and towing. It's not always obvious. It may not be even uncomfortable, but we can see it by, by kind of a pillowing or an elevation you know, the conjunctiva over the edge of the lens. And the patient's usually comfortable, but they may tell you that uh, when they take the lens out, they continue to see an impression ring. And uh, those of you, maybe you follow our, our Facebook page, Scarlet Lens Practitioners, I know I've put up pictures and also others have put up pictures about, well, what do you think about the fit of this lens? And people will have comments and we should do this and do that. And of course, the, the joke is there's no lens on the eye. Uh, but there's such a um, obvious ring, it looks like the lens is still there. So uh, uh, patients may complain about that. And, and one thing that um, very experienced fitters have, have taught me, a lot of my mentors have, have uh, emphasized that at our follow-up visits, we need to be removing these lenses and staining them uh, because uh, to look for rebound, uh, hyperemia, of course, and then look for evidence of, of you know, this kind of, these kind of impressions or, um, you know, insult to the conjunctiva or the limbal area. I think I have a picture of this, yeah. So that's a really important point is, especially those of you who are joining us who are new to scleral lens fitting, just like any contact lens that you're fitting, you want to evaluate the lens. For scleral lenses, you want to instill fluorescein or listening green prior to the lens being removed when they come in for their follow-up but then you always wanna look at the cornea and the conjunctiva and the lids and lashes without the lens to see what's going on. So Tom, to your point, you know, if you take the lens off, you see this ring of staining without the lens, you know, it's really important, oh, this is helpful, this is how I'm going to change my fit. So that's something everyone should hopefully be doing in their follow-ups. Absolutely true. So you can see here down about eight o'clock, uh, there's, you can see that kind of glistening there, kind of that heaped up conjunctiva, and, and that's what I mean. Uh, it's it's um, digging in there. And I think I have an OCT of this, which is uh, pretty embarrassing, but uh, you know, <laughs> the OCT uh, doesn't tell, doesn't lie, does it? Uh, this particular gentleman had a real boggy, spongy conjunctiva. Do you remember how old it was? Chance? Yeah, yeah. This is a, this was one of my earliest patients uh, with advanced keratoconus. This gentleman is in his early fifties. Um, he's got a very big eye uh, and and very boggy conjunctiva. And this is I, it, my earlier fits were in the 15, 16 millimeter range. I wasn't wasn't going to the bigger lenses as yet. Uh, and so in this case, that would have been helpful. But I, I've seen him before and corrected the problem. But yeah, in his 50s, diabetic, overweight, big old eye. Yeah, Garrett Conus. Yeah. I thought there was going to be so some anyway, Texas joke in there. So what? I thought there was going to be a Texas joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a good old boy. He's a good old boy. <laughs> but anyway, so what do you do? Flatten the haptic, torque haptics. Uh, and now we're fortunate that many labs, almost all that I'm familiar with, uh, have quadrant specific haptics, uh, which, I, which I think are very helpful. Now, personally, I find that if we're doing quadrant specific, it's really nice to have some sort of scleral profilometry uh, because a lot of things, you start changing all four meridians, a lot of things can change. It affects the fitting. So uh, those of you who are really getting specialized, uh, I'd recommend looking into that type of equipment. And he, even beyond that, we're getting into empirical fitting, and, and maybe we can chat uh, during the discussion a time about empirical fitting. And when we have scanning technology, uh, certainly we've had impression technology for a while, uh, making lenses um, in, in that way is, is, so, is so precise because then we're not worried about flat here, steep here, spiral or slow. We're not worried about those things because if we can scan and uh, record elevation and angle differences uh, with technology, um, whether, that's, whether that's an instrument or whether that's uh, you know, impression molding, those lenses fit really, really well right out the box. And I think we're gonna see more of that technology 
Uh, and again, we have all this COVID thing. We have disinfection, new disinfection guidelines. I'm also going to catch a paper on that, uh, which, which creates burdens on us to disinfect properly um, our, our diagnostic fits, and it's more time consuming. And uh, so I think we'll see a lot more uh, empirical fitting. But uh, in the meantime, all of us using torque haptics. And then uh, I think the last thing I'm going to chat about is midday fogging. We all see it. We all have it. Our, our good friend Maria Walker at the University of Houston is doing a PhD on it. Uh, so again, I'm showing you all my embarrassing pictures. But, it, but you'll notice, I want to point out one thing. You see how the, it, it, I hope you can see the clearance here is about 269 microns, which is I, it's not bad. I mean, that's not excessive. Uh, but there's a, there was a very good paper on this recently, or two, about a year and a half ago out of the group at the University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham. And what they talked about was uh, leukocyte formation in, you know, in the formation of midday fogging. Uh, it was a very, very good paper. And what they found was, and I think we have it here, uh, a reference. Um, what they found was, um, it, it is very common. I, I'll go to that paper in a second. But uh, the point there is make sure it is midday fogging. Um, a lot of people have it. Uh, up to 40 to 50 percent of patients have it, but you have to differentiate, and I think that's the next picture, is, um, is it midday fogging or is it anterior surface uh, fogging? Um, and here you can see right here, obviously, this is midday fogging. You can see all the debris in the, in the tear film. Um, but again, make sure it's not edema uh, and make sure it's truly on the, in the fluid reservoir, not on the anterior surface. So again, well, it's the old haptic again. Uh, some people believe that if you're not aligned, then the lens has a rocking action and it's stimulating the, the goblet cells to produce mucin. Um, and then again, you're, the pumping action forces uh, this debris under the post lens tear layer. Another thing, though, I, uh, I'll point out because I've been practicing for 36 years and before we had disposable lenses. And uh, well, in the days of non disposable soft lenses, we had a lot of GPC, we fought it all the time. Uh, because people kept lenses for several years with the protein buildup. And with the, with the advent of disposable lenses, which, you know, most of us or most of, especially our younger practitioners have, have, have had their entire practice. Uh, we haven't seen that, but I tell you what, with a lot of scar lenses, it, GPC resurfaces because the lenses are large. They're worn for extended periods of time. They're up underneath the lid. So when you, when you, when you're trying to, work the problem of midday fogging, you have to look at the whole adnexa, you know, the lids, the lashes, tear quality, and don't forget to flip the lids. And I'll add in that meibomian gland dysfunction, you know, is highly prevalent. It's really important to address it in our scleral lens wearers to the maximal level. And also asking, you know, about makeups and products, what they're using, make sure they're not applying makeup to the lower lid or the waterline talking about you know all the things that could possibly lead to the fogging is really important and if you're treating you know the lids and lashes treating that to your maximal level absolutely yeah because how many people the uh, these how many of our scleral patients are atopic or just simply have dry eyes you know so yeah absolutely oh also the lens can be too tight uh, and just kind of sucked on and epithelial cells, which are turning over, just become entrapped. So you just get this stagnant tear film. And uh, this is from the problem shooting. And that, that's what's happening here. And you can see, I mean, look at the retro, look, look at the pupil in the pupil area. You see the retro elimination and see that quite, quite clearly. So sometimes loosening the fit is what you need to do. So it's, it's a, you have to work the problem. Um, it has many, many different things. So uh, sometimes loosening the fit, and this is the same, same patient here, helps. All right, reduce the clearance. This is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, sometimes oblate designs where you have a flatter base curve will help reduce that. Core capix, we you know, just beat that to death. Sometimes a, a smaller diameter will help. Uh, and go, don't forget about adding your viscous solution. And you know, strive for uniform clearance in the mid periphery. Uh, this is an issue sometimes with these very high uh, keratoconus, very elevated cones. We have to have enough sagittal depth to clear the cone, 
but then the, the arc of the lens uh, is such uh, that you have this excessive mid periphery clearance. So work with your lab to get that optimum base curve uh, so that you clear, clear the, the central elevation, uh, but not have it, you know, not have 500 microns of clearance uh, in the mid periphery if you can avoid it. So the leukocyte study was, was very interesting. This is what I was referring to earlier, where they found that um, we produce leukocytes for, you know, it's an inflammatory response to lack of oxygen. And they found that when, when, when all of us awaken in the morning and we assay the tear film, there's a lot of leukocyte formation. And of course that goes away with blinking and flushing and oxygen. But, uh, you know, they, they, they correlated leukocyte um, um, presence of leukocytes in people that had midday fogging. Uh, and they related that to, to the, you know, the clearance of the lens. And they found that uh, lenses that had more than about 250 microns of clearance or so were more subject to midday fogging. I think we have, I have a illustration uh, of that. Yeah, this is out of, out of that article. They said that for every 50 micron increase in the scleral, in scleral clearance, there was a 2.24 times higher odds of, of presenting post lens tear fogging. Uh, and so they were, they were saying they'd like to see the clearance uh, to be around, around 200 microns or less. Obviously, the diameter of your lens will, will, will influence that. Not everybody has midday fogging, but, um, and, and some, some larger lenses are, are fitted with much more volt. So it doesn't bother me per se. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting study, something to, something to remember, something to think about. And this is a really uh, good article in the Contact Lens and Anterior Eye. This is, uh, I think, pre-publication uh, by Muriel Shornack and, and her team. Uh, and they went through all the different scenarios of midday fogging, and all the different possible uh, causes and all the, all the possible remedies. And it's just kind of what I, what I've presented here is just sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. You just have to try to identify the source of the fogging and uh, um, address it. Made me feel a lot better <laughs> because uh, there are all sorts of different causes and, and all sorts of different remedies. So uh, again, I really like labs. I really like consultants. Uh, you know, work with people that, that you know and, and trust. And uh, of course, there's, there's our Facebook groups. And uh, well, there's a lot of help out there, but it can be a frustrating problem. And don't forget to social distance. Uh, we still want to keep this COVID, uh, COVID out of the office. These uh, some of our friends in South Africa sent us this, and so they recommended you know keep a lion's length between uh, you and and uh, the patients. But I uh, can't actually use that. So use an elephant to four elephants. But we can't use that either. So uh, it's just a funny joke. I uh, hope everybody stays safe during this time. All right, Melissa. Okay, so no, I do no harm. Realize our timing, and I do want to allow some time for questions. But so I'm going to just run through this super quick. So um, in 2016, we were brought to the attention that we might be wanting to check intraocular pressure in scleral lens wearers. So McMoney's hypothesized that scleral lenses could actually raise intraocular pressure. A different study by now Shornak uh, looked at healthy subjects in 15 millimeter lenses, a lens worn for two hours, and scleral lenses did not raise intraocular pressure. And here was Vincent's study that looked at changes in intraocular pressure in irregular corneas in a 16.5 millimeter design and looked at two different studies. Um, first, the first study was intraocular pressure before and after with the ORA, and then the follow-up study was looking at IOP with a non-contact tonometer, and there was a decrease in intraocular pressure. Um, here, Longis' study uh, looked at changes in intraocular pressure. The diaton was used, and I like this graph here. The intraocular pressure difference was statistically significant based on time, but not lens diameter and just wanted to get to this one here. And so this is Steve Vincent and his group that uh, this was just published in February of 2020. 
And this study evaluated the influence of short-term fenestrated scleral lenses. And here you can see a picture of the central fenestration, which of course would not be you know, clinically relevant because patients who wear scleral lenses probably need to see. However, this was an interesting study. The intraocular pressure was measured by a rebound tonometer, so the eye care tonometer. It was measured before, during, and after wear of a fenestrated scleral lens, 50 young, healthy adults with normal corneas. And here you can see immediately after lens insertion, about you know, most patients, 96% of patients had an elevated um, intraocular pressure. After removal, 50% of people had a reduction in intraocular pressure, and the remaining 50% intraocular pressure was slightly greater than the pre-insertion pressure. Now, this is one study. Of course, it has a central fenestration. I have questions on the eye care tonometer itself since there haven't been previous studies. We're actually, we did a non, you know, IRB approved, but just a short trial in office using the eye care tonometer on the scleral conjunctiva and showed actually no, no correspondence to the cornea at all. I'm interested to see sort of the factors that um, using this interesting fenestrated lens with the eye care, if there are other factors. So basically, I think future studies need to be done so is this an artifact or is this a true elevation? But getting to the key point here, you know, I think from all this research, we should have perhaps a little more caution in our patients who have glaucoma, who are suspects for glaucoma, who have ocular hypertension, anyone that we might be worried about, those who have a family history of glaucoma, it's good to establish baseline parameters. So not just intraocular pressure, we want to check OCT, visual fields. And in these patients, of course, we want to check the pressure after the lenses are removed at each visit. So just thinking about how we want to design our lenses, should we design them differently in these patients? Of course, if they have a blubber or tube, we want to avoid that. Um, but should we choose a corneal GP, for example? Should we choose a hybrid or a piggyback option? for our patients. Um, I know that there are a few of my patients where I thought, oh, you know, their glaucoma is going downhill. I'd really like to get them out of the scleral lens, get them into something different. And working with their glaucoma specialist, and it's, I, I really haven't done so well convincing these patients to get out of their scleral lenses because they're so happy with them. But I think this is something we need to um, look to moving forward. We are doing a study at UC Davis currently looking at scleral lenses and intraocular pressure in a diverse population, irregular corneas, a variety of conditions, and checking with pneumotonometry. So we've just analyzed our first data. Uh, we do need to collect more data post-COVID and uh, looking forward to sharing that with you in the future. So thank you so much for the time and attention and let's open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa and Tom, for this, uh, for this presentation. Uh, we will open them, um, the uh, open discussion session. So I just uh, received a question for for you, do you think if the IOP will change with change in diameter of the lens? Is there any study showing large diameter lenses will give more IOP? So I think it's more than the diameter, it's actually the fit of the lens, um, which is what I was sort of hinting at as well. So there, I guess I'll share some uh, preliminary data, we have not found um, a difference with a larger diameter lens. Okay, so I have a question for you uh, regarding the um, midday fogging. Different professionals suggest to their patient to remove the lenses as Tom uh, stated before, wash them and put fresh solution to apply them again so they resolve the fogging during the day. But in these crazy times, recommending this would mean that we are telling our patients to, to go to the restroom in their office and put themselves at, at risk in the, encountering viruses and bacteria. 
I'll, I'll, I'll start and then maybe Tom can, can answer. So, you know, I prefer to, for my patients not to remove their lenses in general, if possible, you know, if it's a patient who has a graft I'm concerned about and they have limited hours of lens wear or something like that. Um, but I actually find that midday fogging is much better than it used to be many years ago based on newer lens designs and managing the ocular surface. So for years before, prior to COVID, my patients didn't want to do that, Dottie. They did not feel comfortable if they're at work in an office, for example, going to a public place. They don't want to do that. And so I like to try and avoid have for them to remove the lenses at all. And especially now, you know, we don't want to touch our eyes and our hands. And, you know, so I, I completely agree that we'd like to avoid midday removal and reapplication if if at all possible, and do everything. So there are some new solutions that are available out there. We can use more viscous solutions, as Tom mentioned, but I really believe we have to get to that ocular surface. We have to address their meibomian gland dysfunction, their dry eye disease, and with our newer lens designs, it's much better than it used to be. Okay, your turn, uh, Tom. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, and and I don't recommend that they take them out. Statistically, the scope studies have, have shown that patients have to. I don't recommend it, uh, and I find that uh, I totally agree with you, Melissa, that it's not as much a problem as it used to be, because maybe oxygen has a role to play, and, and we're fitting better, and we're using better materials. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, I, I, maybe most, hopefully some of you agree, that sometimes it goes away, it's an adaptation. You know, it, it's an adaptation to a foreign object where the goblet cells are upset and they're producing mucus. And if the patients just hang with it over time, in many cases, I've, I've found that it takes care of itself, that it's an adaptive phenomenon. Absolutely, yes. I would suggest also an alternative uh, effective way, maybe holding the preserver preservative um, free saline to the lens yeah. and, and squeeze it, squeeze the solution under the lens. This might be helpful also. Yeah, that's great too. Okay, I have other question regarding the, um, uh, um, I will check with, okay, besides the haptic design, I feel midday fogging is in large part a component of test physiology. I found many scleral wearers need patadei or xedra or et cetera. Yeah, well, we know that, you know, inflammation can definitely play a role and allergies as well. You know, where I practice, we it's a huge, we have so many allergies, it's actually horrible. So yes, controlling inflammation is very important. So controlling allergies with some sort of mast cell stabilizer, antihistamine, um, as far as a prescription drop for dry eye, definitely depends on the patient, you know, depends on their condition, the severity of their dry eye. There are also, you know, serum tears that some patients need to use. There are, you know, I think kind of getting to the bottom of the midday fogging, we need to address the entire ocular surface and that should help. Of course, the thing we didn't really highlight are solutions. You know, we do need to talk about solutions, of course, with every patient, disinfecting solutions. We can switch to a hydrogen peroxide solution, which I find to be really helpful. If they're using a multi-purpose solution, making sure they're rinsing that off uh, prior to lens application. And then, of course, reviewing their application solutions and making sure that they're using a fresh one every day um, and applying more viscous drops if needed. Okay, thank you. Another question, how do you deal with boggy conjunctiva? Boggy conjunctiva. Can... It, their conjunctiva is their conjunctiva. I know some people, I, I think again, it's a fit issue, maybe a larger, flatter lens, you know, just, just a, a larger area landing zone. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, uh, some I haven't done this myself. Uh, again, maybe some of you can speak to that. Some people uh, are referred. Some patients are referred for uh, uh, conjunctival, you know, resection. You know, that the, they just have redundant conjunctival conjunctival colitis. I haven't I haven't had that. To, again, you know, a lot of these problems. 
you have to think about, or is, you know, are, is this a problem? You know, not every fit's going to look beautiful. You know, not every fit's going to be, you know, on, on the cover of a magazine. And you have to think, is this a problem? Is it a visual problem? Is it a physiologic problem? Or do I just not like the way this looks? You know, uh, our, our good friend Chris Sint said, if you're going to change something, Make, why do you want to change it? You know, what, what is your end goal? So again, the, these are, these are sick eyes. Okay. Going back. I, sorry. Oh, oh I, I just, just a few more comments there. So Tom, I agree with you. You know, sometimes we need to go a little bit larger in diameter um, for these patients. Um, you know, 1920 in, in the U S for us that large, not for other places in the world. Um, and then sometimes we can go to an impression based in the, for these patients, but I completely agree with the comment is, you know, what are we wanting to change? If the patient has good vision, good comfort, good physiology, their eye looks very healthy, they are not concerned. Is it our problem? And I struggle with that a lot. Like I want the fit to look perfect all the time. And maybe it's really my issue is that the patient's happy. I want the fit to look better. That's the point. Okay, going back to midday fogging, and then we will have uh, more questions for IOP. Midday fogging, neutrophil might help? Yes, so I can answer that. So neutrophil, which has electrolytes in it, um, has been beneficial so far. So, so far, so good. Um, especially for those patients who do have fogging, they report that they have better vision, better comfort uh, with their lenses. It does come in at 10 ml vial in a 35 pack box um, and it's distributed by Pontemac. Okay. Is there any possibility that scleroless design can control IOP in future? Mm. Wow. I like where they're going with that. So, you know, there's a lot of potential as far as contact lenses um, for drug delivery. I actually just wrote a manuscript that got accepted on this topic, yay. So that will be coming out soon. You know, I, I'm excited about the future. It's interesting to see all the studies that have been done in the past and we don't have a lot of products just in general right that are out there on the market as far as contact lenses and i'm talking all contact lenses here soft lenses scleral lenses everything but i think that could be an option in the future okay what about checking iop with a lens on Mm -hmm. So we have a, a, Tom, I can stop talking here and you can answer. No, 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 go ahead. No. So we check with pneumotonometry, um, which is a device where you can check on the scleral conjunctiva. And it's a, I had a picture of it. It's a huge clunky dinosaur looking instrument that makes a horrible sound. It's like, dun, dun, like it's awful. Um, but it, it, that's what we're using uh, to check intraocular pressure with a scleral lens on the eye. As you can see in the other image, the diaton is another option. And then um, really, you know, just as I mentioned in clinic, we are testing the eye care. Um, and that's a study that needs to be done, checking eye care just without a scleral lens in general on the conjunctiva because that study hasn't been done. So any of you that are interested in doing a study, that's, that's one that needs to be done. But our numbers were all over the place. And it really you know, depends on where it, it's checked too. So it is important to be consistent. We tend to check superior temporal. That's what the previous studies have showed um, with the new motonometer. Okay. Yeah, I, we, have, we are big eye care users and like it a lot. That's great. I, I appreciate that tip. I'm gonna start doing that. Uh, I will, um, jump in about uh, Jan Bergmanson, who we all know, who's a you know, preeminent um, uh, anatomist, who talks a lot about uh, most of these devices are referencing the cornea, of course, the pneumotometry or the di di diatom or not, but he talks uh, extensively about the, the physiology, the, arch the histology of the different in the sclera the, in, in the cornea, and that makes a difference. And so we really need long-term studies about, well, is this the proper, are these instruments really measuring what we think they're measuring? Because if we're basing them on, you know, corneal histology, then that's very different than, uh, you know, and he, he, I've seen many slides, you have too, of, you know, the, 
the electron microscopy of these areas, and they're quite different. So uh, it, it's a it's fascinating and a and a, and a scary topic. Uh, I, I I've seen a lot of glaucoma it, through my various uh, practice modes, and and I really don't like glaucoma. I'm I'm very concerned about it, and and yeah. You know. Okay. What about conjunctival prolapse? So how, you know, how much do you worry about it? I think it really, you know, depends. And going back to our earlier discussion, you know, if the patient is not symptomatic, they have good vision, good comfort, and you have prolapse, that is, when you take the lens off, the conjunctiva kind of bounces back, I'm not concerned. Now, if there's neovascularization on the cornea or if the prolapse is adherent, so it's actually touching and it's not moving back, then that's something I'm worrying about. So um, Tom, similar to you, I've not, I think, had any patients who have had to have conjunctival resection. Um, I know some of our colleagues, they do this commonly, so they send patients very commonly. Um, but I'm always concerned about what happens after the surgery for whatever it is? You know, what happens after the intacts when the intacts are removed and then I'm fitting the lens? What is happening at, no, seriously, I mean, I know you all are nodding because that's what we deal with, right? What happens after we have some sort of whatever, it, even a pterygium removal, and then we're fitting a lens? Like, what is the eye going to look like after it's healed? So, of course, that's what we're all dealing with. So maybe I'm a little bit more conservative and not sending patients for surgery, but I think we can change the lens designs oftentimes in these patients with prolapse. We can go for a larger landing. We can go for a larger or smaller diameter, you know, depending on the eye. Um, we can always move on to impression-based. And again, I think sometimes it's my problem <laughs> that I'm thinking, you know, the patient's really happy, but I want the lens to look better. Yeah, I totally agree, 110%. Did it did all that? Here's another question that I brought up earlier: How to eliminate towing? Well, true On towing the is the the, exactly. the lens is too steep. It, it's too steep, so you have to flatten the haptic. You know, make sure you have the right diameter. I mean. I find a lot of people who write me or, or post on, on the, our Facebook page, you know, one of the, one of the quickest questions or the first questions I ask them when they talk about some problem with the lens is, you know, what is your HVID? You know, what is the size of your, what's the size of the eye, what's the size of the lens? So many patients or so many practitioners, uh, they, they either fit one or two lenses or just one lens and they put the same lens on everybody. Hmm. And, and the diameter of the lens is extremely important. If you don't know anything else, you know, if you don't have the right diameter, my feeling is you're going to struggle, you know, if it doesn't fit the first time, you're going to completely struggle with it. It's like, like putting the wrong size shoe on, you know, it's never going to fit right. Um, and so with, with towing, you know, obviously it's digging in, you need to flatten it, but is that the right, is that the right diameter lens in the first place? So. And one final question, what are your thoughts on using serum tears with sclerals? Do you have your severe ocular surface disease patients use them without the lenses, over the lenses, inside the bowl of the lens? I, in some cases, we use it, and they found it very, very beneficial. So I personally, I don't know what you do, Melissa, but personally, I'll, I'll have them fill up a third of the lens, maybe. You don't do, it's, sometimes the serum tears are a little turbid, or they usually are somewhat turbid. We use a, usually a 5% albumin type titration and about a third uh, of the bowl. Yeah, so I find, yeah, it it's, it's, can be very, very effective. And I do kind of a combination. So some patients, I like to start with two drops of the serum tears um, along with whatever uh, recommended application solution. Some patients, it really isn't beneficial, so I'll have them use the serum tears prior to scleral lens insertion and after lens removal, but I do not have them use the serum tears over the lens. Okay. Uh, two last questions. How do, do you treat conjunctal restaining with loose conjunctiva outside the lens? So, you know, something that was taught, you know, many years ago is that we're going to, we're going to treat whatever we can cover. 
right, with a scleral lens. So if we have a 16 millimeter lens, whatever's under that is what we're going to help. I have patients who have Sjogren's, I have a lot of patients who have severe dry eye and they have staining outside of that lens diameter. And even like the last time, you know, I saw this, I said, I, I, I said, may I take a picture? Because this is what we talk about all the time. And the patients, oh, of course you can. And I did, but we see that very commonly. So, you know, we want to address any underlying systemic disease. So in Sjogren's syndrome, working with rheumatology, for example, treating them systemically, we want to treat um, to our maximal levels, including all the things I just talked about. We want to, might want to add a humidifier, moisture goggles, day, night, omegas, you know, all these things. But there are times where we're doing all of this and we will still see staining outside of the lens on the conjunct Okay. The last question. I'm going to have to run. Uh, I've got to put on my mask. Oh, you have to go. work. Okay. I have to go to work. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you for much. having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Melissa, for all your hard work in this. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Ciao to everyone and uh, stay safe. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Alrighty. Thank you, Melissa, right. for this session. Bye -bye. For, thank you, everyone, Bye. for participating. Melissa can go. I just have to go. <laughs> yes, right. just one last question, Melissa, and then we will close the session. For graft patients, can we add their hypertonic drops to scleral lens on insertion with saline? Other tips to assess all grafts that are struggling with? Yes, so this is actually, um, some studies are coming up on this as far as drops in the bowl to help with these patients. Um, I always like to use preservative free products. And at this point, um, I, I don't have that unless it's compounded, but that's a good thought. Um, what some of the tips for lens fitting that we've been doing is using fenestrations in the haptics or using channels within the lens to try and promote oxygen. Um, I'm looking, especially with these graphs that I'm concerned about, and believe me, I. We did a study at UC Davis. I am so concerned about this. I've been so concerned for many years. And so, you know, sometimes I'm fitting the lens differently than I might. So I might purposely fit it a little looser to increase tear exchange, but so far so good um, with the fenestrations within the haptic and the channels as well. Okay. So the, uh, this session will finish here. We will have another meeting uh, next Saturday. So please go on the website and register for the, for the following, for the further uh, meeting. Thank you so much for everyone. And thank you, Mindy and Dottie. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you. It's so good to see all of you from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend, everyone.